Hey, what's up, guys? Coach Austin here. Welcome to episode 30 of the Physique Development Podcast. Podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. Today's episode is going to be another rapid Q&A. But before we dive in, we're going to do what we've been doing, which is our newest segment, Reviews and Comments. To get you guys more involved in the podcast and, and each episode, we're going to read one comment and one review to help show our appreciation and to answer any questions that may arise on previous episodes. Okay, so the review this week is from Emma. She said, I love this podcast. There's so much knowledge here. I feel like in our episode, I get more than any other podcast offers. So wealth of knowledge for our, at our disposal. And not to mention, Alex, Sue, and Austin are amazing. Well, thank you, Emma. It's very kind of you. Appreciate the review. Reviews go a long way for podcasts. If you guys haven't heard that a million times already, um, and we do appreciate every um, review that comes in. So thank you, thank you for that, Emma, and for everyone else who's left us a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So thank you very much. If you guys would like an opportunity for us to read your review on the podcast, go over to Apple Podcasts and give us a review, and we'll read your comment. Or read your review. Easy as that. All right, on to the YouTube comment. This is from Adamus. I am not even going to attempt your last name. So this is from YouTube. Uh, we appreciate your comment. This is on uh, our previous episode, which is episode 29, uh, which is, was a rapid Q&A. Um, so Adamus, that's even how you say your first name. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if you guys are interested in trying to take a crack at his last name, Go to episode 29 on YouTube and give it your best effort. All right. His question. Why, why RDL split squats, leg presses? Why are those the best exercises for glutes instead of glute bridges or the hip thrust or something like that? And if you guys listen to episode 29, you'll know we kind of took a stab at giving our, our favorite glute exercises. And we didn't necessarily, you know, give an honorable mention to the glute bridge or to the hip thrust. Um, and you know, that really isn't for any other reason. Um, and, and I'll kind of, I'll kind of touch on this within, within the answer. And I think this is a great question. Okay. Uh, and, and basically he expanded on that and said, is it because of like the stretch mediated hypertrophy? Um, you know, is it good to superset these movements, things like that. So, you know, why do RDL split squats and leg presses get more of a mention from us than glute bridges, right? And this is a great question. And these movements all train the glutes very, very well and throughout a large range of motion, right? More specific to the RDL split squat and leg press. And they can be loaded really, really well. Okay, the glute bridge is still an awesome exercise and you'll see us use it. We use it with clients. We use it on our, our training app, the training club. And we have plenty of tutorials on it on our YouTube channel. We love the movement. You'll see us performing it, all of those things. We just wanted to give mention to other exercises other than the glute bridge, because to be honest, the glute bridge normally hogs a lot of the attention as far as glutes go. And we just wanted to essentially give merit to other movements that are still really good glute builders and, and ones that we use with clients. Um, we're using with competitors to, to bring up their glutes on stage and things like that. So that is why we gave those more of an honorable mention over the glute bridge, but all of those are still fantastic for building your glutes. If you guys want to learn more about what I'm even talking about and why that question came up, go back to episode 29 and listen into that one. That one is again, another rapid Q and a which we answered quite a few questions really. So uh, go back if you guys are interested in more of that rapid Q&A format, uh, go do that. If you'd like to read your questions on the podcast, leave us a comment under this YouTube video or a different one, and we'll go back and uh, retrieve it and answer it on a podcast. And again, if you guys are wanting us to read a review of your own on the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. All right, without further ado, onward and upward to today's episode, episode 30. Gonna be another 
rapid Q&A. And if you guys are watching on YouTube, you're going to see that you only see me today. This is another solo episode by yours truly, Coach Austin. And um, Alex and Sue are traveling currently, so pretty tough to coordinate all of that. Um, so just me today. We're going to go over three very commonly asked questions that I get all the time. Okay. And that's going to be today's episode. So question one, should you deadlift on back day or leg day? This is a very common question that I receive in my DMs. And I took a poll to see what percentage of you guys did deadlifts on back day versus leg day. 62% of you deadlift on leg day. 38% of you said you deadlift on back day. Interesting. Okay, although I don't consider either of these a technical right answer, I think it's important to speak through a logical lens and consider both options. Okay, I'm going to walk through my logical reasoning for performing deadlifts on a leg focus day. So I'm really kind of with the majority here. I'm with that 62%. But understand this is me just walking through my thought process, nothing more. If you guys have any objections or would like to discuss them, I'm happy to do so. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit us with a comment in the comment section below uh, right now, if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening in your car or on a walk and you would like to contribute to the conversation, head over to this YouTube podcast, this YouTube video on our channel. It'll be under the playlist full episodes of the PD podcast. And leave us a, leave us a comment below. Which one do you perform it on. All right, let's get into it. When looking at which muscles are being used within an exercise, we need to first look at which joints are being most challenged throughout the range of motion of the particular exercise, right? So in a deadlift, the joints being challenged and being used to contribute to the range of motion of the exercise are that of the hip, knee, and ankle. Yes, your wrist, elbow, and shoulder joints are being challenged to hold the barbell, but those joints do not contribute directly to the range of motion of the exercise. Okay. It's a very important distinction. Using this logic, the deadlift exercise will most challenge the muscles around the hip, knee, and ankle. Therefore, I believe it makes the most sense to be programmed on a leg focused session. Now there are things to consider here. Number one, I know holding the load is technically contributing to the exercise as a whole, but it is not contributing directly to the range of motion. Two, your back absolutely will take some volume here within this exercise, and it's wise to keep this in consideration when evaluating your current back volume. And three, if you like to deadlift on back day because your the load on your spine is taken on by other movements like a back squat on leg day or, or something like that, then go for it. Deadlift on your back day. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Um, I'm just telling you kind of my logical reasoning of why I would personally like to, I would personally prefer it, the deadlift to be on leg day versus a back day, but that isn't to say that it doesn't have merit on a different day. Right. Um, so that's that. Let, let us know in the comments. Let us know what you think. And yeah, question two, will cardio make me lose my gains? It's a very common concern. Uh, quick answer, no. But obviously there's context and nuance to this. So the thing I say all the time is don't be scared out of doing cardiovascular or aerobic work. Obtaining aerobic health will only help your overall health and long-term ability to put on muscle tissue. Improving your ability to utilize oxygen will never go out of style. The better you are at this process, the better you will be at recovering from high volume training sessions, which is very important for long-term gains. Okay. Now, if you guys are in a place where gyms are locked down still, you guys are in another, in another lockdown, or, you know, maybe you're not going to the gym or maybe you're taking time off from the gym or you simply just like getting out of the gym for your fitness, which I have no objections to. There are times where I don't want to go to the gym, to be honest with you. And, you know, 
Um, I'm very motivated to be in the gym. I love the gym. It's brought a lot to my life. I wrote a book on the gym, on strength training. Um, but there, there, de there are definitely times where I don't feel like going. And I would rather spend, you know, that two to three to four weeks of time focusing on other goals, which in this case are going to be aerobic, right? Improving our cardiovascular and aerobic health, right? And daily walks, running, uh, may be a great alternative for you, right? And this can be used in conjunction with training in the gym, right? With strength training. And if you're normally going to the gym six days a week and you're like, hey, over the next three to four weeks, I'd much rather just take time kind of away from the gym and only go to the gym maybe two to three times a week, but I still want to be active and improve my fitness and, and maybe prioritize my aerobic health or cardiovascular health. You know, I'd rather kind of like take up running than, than go for it, right? Um, aside from being a part of effective fitness programs and routines, incorporating more aerobic work during a time where you're not wanting to be in the gym or when life sort of needs to slow down or, or whatever else, go for it, right? So as, as I said up before this, obtaining aerobic health will only help your overall health and long-term ability to put on muscle tissue, right? And the, the research is pretty clear when it comes to being able to retain muscle mass during reduced training volumes, right? So, which it's clear in saying that we have a lot of wiggle room here, right? You may feel a little bit more flat, less full, um, you know, you may lose a touch of strength in terms of your, you know, overall skill of movement or just general, like you couldn't probably walk off the street and do the same one rep max after four weeks, of, you know, not squatting or something, but you're not going to lose all your gains, right? You're not going to lose all of your strength. And the research is pretty clear there. So don't be scared out of prioritizing your health, prioritizing your fitness in different ways. Uh, and prioritizing aerobic and cardiovascular work, okay? So there's no need to worry about your hard, and ga hard earned gains. Your hard work is not for nothing and your gains will not be lost. And if a slight loss occurs, it will be gained back in a fraction of the time, right? We have muscle memory on our side, biology on our side here, um, thankfully, and nothing to worry about. So if you'd like a variety in your training, uh, break things up, doing a phase or two where you mainly focus on improving your aerobic health will be great for you. We do this for clients here at Physique Development. And, um, you know, there's no objections to wanting to change it up a bit and improve other parts of your fitness, all right? Other parts of your health. Question three, this is going to be our last question. Today's a shorter episode. So you don't have to suffer through too much with just me. Question three, if you had to choose only two exercises to grow your hamstrings, what would they be? I'm not sure where all these ultimatums come from. I get the sentiment of the question, but we're never in the situation where you can only really choose two, but I'll stick with the question. If you could only choose two exercises to grow your hamstrings, what would they be? So we've discussed hamstrings more in depth here on the podcast. So if you're wanting to do more of a deep dive on the muscle group itself, see episode 26. That's our muscle group series on the hamstrings. So we go into anatomy, muscle function, exercises we use with clients, reasons why, common mistakes, all that jazz on that episode. Episode 26, if you're interested. All right. So we have two functions of the hamstring, uh, one hip extension, the other one being knee flexion. For these two muscle joint actions, we really like the RDL and lying leg curl to fulfill the roles of movements that challenge hip extension in the RDL and knee flexion with the lying leg curl. All right, so the RDL does a great job of training the lengthened position alongside training the hamstring in its role or function of hip extension. Okay. So again, main points of the RDL, the RDL trains the hamstrings and its function of hip extension, which is very important. And the RDL trains and overloads the hamstrings and its lengthened position 
where the muscle is stretched from its resting position. Okay, very, very important and a very useful tool within our tool belt of training and exercise selection. Some common mistakes when doing RDLs are going outside your active range of motion, which basically means going too far down where you don't really have the allotment in your range of motion or your capabilities within your hip flexion um, to really manage that load properly. And we actually have some new YouTube videos on this. So if you want to head over to our YouTube channel, uh, click on the videos tab. It'll be one of the most more recent ones. I think it's titled two common mistakes clients make when performing the RDL, something of the sort. So that kind of goes into a couple of different common mistakes that are made, um, in which I touch on here. Um, uh, but I kind of show you in that YouTube video, what that looks like. Okay, so the first one is going outside of that active range of motion, right? Going too far down, being out of the range of motion that you really deserve to be in, right? You need to be in. Next one is not maintaining a neutral spine, right? And we hear a lot about neutral spine, creating neutrality within the spine. And we talked about neutrality within the spine on this podcast quite a bit, right? And it comes down to vulnerabilities. It comes down to kinks in the chain when it comes to potential injury down the road, right? So if there's ever a time where we can limit injury potential, why wouldn't we do it, right? We still have an effective exercise. We're still loading the hamstrings properly. Uh, we're loading them in their lengthened stretch position. There's a lot of hypertrophy potential there. The RDL is a movement we, that we can load up with a lot of load safely if done properly, right? So maintain neutrality within the spine the best you can. Keep your abs engaged. Keep that chin tucked. Don't look up towards the ceiling. That's a common mistake on cueing uh, for people. Um, you know, kind of pick a gaze, a forward gaze on something kind of like you know, don't look, you're not looking down and you're not looking up, right? But it's just sort of a neutral gaze right in front of you on the floor, uh, just ahead of you on the floor. Um, and, and allow your neck and, and allow things to move naturally as you do, as you go through the range of motion and as you go through the movement, right? But we're not trying to overly look down or overly look up and extend or flex the neck or spine. We're just trying to keep some, some neutrality to it. Uh, and allow the muscles and joints to be working that are supposed to be working, right? Which is that of the hip and knee, right? Um, depending on which variation of the deadlift you're doing, whether it's a straight leg deadlift or a Romanian deadlift or bent knee deadlift. Um, but our main goal of that movement is hip flexion, hip extension, again, which is that main function of any RDL or straight leg deadlift or anything like that, uh, is to challenge those prime movers, the hamstrings, the glutes, adductors, things like that within their function of hip extension. Okay. So that's one, that's exercise one gun to my head. I have to choose two. exercise. One is the RDL. I think it's fantastic. Exercise number two is the lying leg curl. No surprise here. We talk a lot about the lying leg curl here on the podcast and, uh, we love it. Seated leg curl still pretty cool but not as cool as the lying leg curl is in my opinion. So lying leg curl trains the hamstrings in the function of knee flexion. Very, very important. And it trains the hamstring within its shortened position, right? Hip extension, knee flexion, right? So if your if your hip is extended and your knee is flexed, that is a fully shortened hamstring. So if you're standing like an, uh, what is that? Like a flamingo stand like a flamingo. So if you're not driving, if you're on a walk right now or in the gym or doing anything else other than driving, stand on one leg, extend that hip back, one of those hips back and then flex the knee. And you're going to feel that hamstring shorten, right? That's obviously the standing position of a lying leg curl. Uh, but that's what's happening. That's what's happening in a lying leg curl. Uh, and that's what makes it so great. Uh, it trains and overloads that hamstring in the short position, fully contracted position, um, which is hard to do without a lying leg curl machine, 
I mean, truthfully, it is, uh, especially with the amount of load that you can load it up with and challenge knee flexion with a lying leg, leg curl, right? You can do it with bands. You can do it with a lot of different things, but uh, nothing quite equates to that of the lying leg curl. So huge, huge fan. We use a ton with clients. Um, you'll see it pop up a lot within our programs on the Training Club app. We love it. Um, there's a lot of different rep schemes you can use with both of these, right? We've talked about that on the hamstrings episode, episode 26. Go back to listen to that if you're interested. So some common mistakes. I went over common mistakes with the RDL. I'm going to do it here with the lying leg curl. So common mistakes within the lying leg curl. Launching the weight out of the bottom, all right? So the gastroc, gastrocnemius, the calf muscle, is responsible for the first 10 to 15-ish, 20 degrees of knee flexion. Okay, so if you're your knee is straight and that first 15, 10 to 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion of you bending that knee is mainly done by the calf. Okay. Mainly responsible for the calf. Okay. Or the calf's mainly responsible for that movement. Right. And we talked about this a lot on the podcast as well. And a lot of those muscle group series episodes where we have these muscles that have multiple functions, right? The calf is a knee flexor, right? But it is also mainly responsible for things that happen at the ankle, right? Uh, we don't often think of it doing things at the knee, but it does, okay? And we have these muscles all around our body that really kind of help us pass off tension to the bigger muscle group that we are wanting to actually take most of that load, right? And that's what's happening here within the leg curl. The calf muscle is basically getting that leg into a position of leverage and advantage for that hamstring, right? Because if your leg is completely straightened, you're, you know, if you're, let's say you're flexing your quad, your knee is fully straightened, your, your hamstring has next to no leverage to curl the leg or to flex the knee, right? Almost zero leverage to do that. Right. So we need something to get it into a position where it can gain leverage. And that's what the cap does for us. That's what the gas drop does for us. Okay. So when you launch the weight from the bottom, it's not that all momentum is terrible and you're a bad person, but what it does mean is that if your goal is to really focus and train the hamstrings within the lying leg curl, you don't necessarily want to launch the weight from the bottom because if you launch and mainly most of that load is you drive through most of that load through that first 10 to 15 degrees of the movement first 15 to 20 degrees in the movement you're you're dominating that movement with your calves right which is not necessarily the goal but that is to say the lying leg curl can actually be used as a great calf exercise and you can actually use the lying leg curl as a calf exercise if you do launch from the bottom, right? So if we're wanting to focus on the hamstrings here, don't launch from the bottom, go a bit slower in the beginning and then accelerate into that rep as that knee flexes. We have a video, fantastic video that Alex and Sue filmed at Katie Hearn Chin or going over the lying leg curl. And there's also a great video if you have a training partner or if you are a trainer yourself on how to properly spot, how to be a good spotter for the lying leg curl. Both of those videos are on our YouTube channel. Both fantastic, okay? So launching out of the bottom, using the calves mainly for the lying leg curl. Um, if the goal is hamstring training are two very common mistakes that we see. The third one is too, too much pelvic movement, right? Some is okay right? Some is fine. Some is totally fine. But allowing those spinal erectors, those lower back muscles to take over, this is not the goal, right? And this is really evident when the hips really rise up and that low back goes into hyperextension, right? You can probably imagine yourself doing it. You've probably seen people do it. You probably do it yourself. So 
make sure those abs stay engaged, right? Make sure that we keep good stability on the handles, the bench, all of the things that apply or give us something to press into, right? As we're laying down and just focus purely on flexing the knee. Okay. While staying stable everywhere else. And again, we touch on this on the technique video on YouTube, which is a great video. I know I've said that probably four times, but I promise you it's good. So if I had to choose two exercises for hamstrings, that would be it. Those would be the two. Okay. If you had to choose two, what would they be? Again, if you guys are watching on YouTube, leave us a comment down below. Very interested to know which two exercises would you do? Some other honorable mentions here, Nordic hamstring curl. That's a fantastic one. Very challenging applications to help build resilience and strength within the hamstring and knee. It could be great for really injury prevention more so. Great for athletes. Uh, great just in general for knee health, hip health, hamstring health, all that stuff. Um, seated leg curls, another great one. Another honorable mention. Yeah. Hamstring episode, episode 26. If you guys are wanting to learn more about hamstrings, that is your place. All right. So today we cover, should you deadlift on back or leg day? I think leg day, but it could be back day too. Go back to listen to some of that logic that I gave in question one. Question two is, will cardio make me lose all my gains? The answer is no. Don't be scared out of doing aerobic work. Don't let people tell you that it's bad for you. It's not bad for you, right? A proper management of volume and intensity, no matter what modality you're choosing to do, is the most important thing. Um, if your goal is long-term gains or long-term health and fitness, aerobic work and cardiovascular work is very, very important. It's very crucial. It's very good for you. Okay, don't be scared out of being healthy, essentially. Um, if people say otherwise, I don't know if they're giving it their full attention and thought, to be honest with you. Question three was, if I only had to choose two exercises to grow my hamstrings, what would they be? That was the RDL and lying leg curl. If you guys missed any of that, go back and listen to that part of the episode. Everything should be timestamped. Again, we'd love to hear from you in the comment section. And if you would love one of your reviews or comments to show up on an episode, go ahead and leave us one of the two on either Apple Podcasts or YouTube. And that is going to be it for today's episode. Thank you, as always. That was a terrible way to say that. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you so much for your time. We really enjoy this podcast. We love doing it. Um, and we really appreciate all of you that do listen and do contribute and engage and, and just take the time. Honestly, there's so many podcasts out there. And so we are very appreciative. Just know that. All right. See you next time.